a couple of seconds of the recording, but that's okay. Adding languages. Uh, basically, everything in multilingual can be run from this little configuration languages, uh, region and languages panel. There are other ways to do it, but if you ever, like, hey, how do I need to do something or where do I go for it, you can access it all from here. And in the languages section, when you're first starting or adding a new language later on, Drupal has, I don't know, 30 or 40 included languages where if you enable these, they tend to just work. They come with some interface, interface translations already done for you. Um, so they're a good call if you need one of those. However, for law help, we had to add a custom language. And uh, this screen is when you, when you add one, this is adding the interface language files that come with the, the language. But for custom languages, you can add anything. Um, Hmong is not an included Drupal language. So we had to figure out that we need a custom language. We had to give it a language code. We had to name it. And then we had to tell it what direction it is. So for language codes, one thing I figured out after I installed this and started actually doing multilingual is if you don't use an approved language code that Drupal recognizes, views will kind of throw a fit and you end up with fatal errors. I don't know if that's solved yet, but at least that's the way it used to be. So every one of these commerce guys' addresses works with views. Not all of them will match what your language actually wants for the prefix, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But you can use any one of these, and it will work for your custom language. So once you have your languages in there, you have to tell Drupal how to detect them. And there's multiple different ways. The one that I recommend is the URL path prefix, um, especially if you're using a custom language. And what that's going to do is it's going to read the URL, and it's going to say, OK, it's got a prefix with the language code of ES. This page needs to be rendered in Spanish. A good fallback is selected languages. That means if the user ever ends up on a URL that doesn't have a language code, but needs to be translated. If they had already pre-selected a language, it would be rendered in that language. So the reason I like the URL path prefix is one, it gives me a lot of ways to plug in for theming, JS, Twig. I can read that path and do a lot of things um, on the front end. It also lets me set the prefix that I want for each language. So as I mentioned, law help was very big on cultural sensitivity, and VI is not a culturally sensitive prefix for Hmong. Um, so what I did is I used VI because that's the commerce code that I needed. And then I just told Drupal, well, instead of showing VI, show HM. And for each language, you can also edit it. This is including the included languages. You can set their um, left to right, right to left, whatever you need to. And you can also translate their labels so that when a Spanish person is viewing the language switcher block in Spanish, it reads Espanol. So we've got our languages in, and now we need to do different translation types. Uh, the types of translations, as you probably figured out from the modules, content translation for editors, configuration translation is for site builders, and interface translation is more for um, front-end devs and back-end people. But they're three very distinct sections. Content translation basically means translating your entities, allowing your content types, your fields, your paragraphs, everything to be translated by an editor so that you don't have to go in there and do it all. Every entity type can be translated. If it's on Drupal, it can be translated. So to do this, you enable each entity type individually, kind of like if you worked with Search API and you pick you know, your data source bundles. Um, and then you also choose what fields on that entity type can be translated. So for a while, it's, and it's still kind of out there, I think, there's an urban legend that paragraphs can't be translated, which is true. The paragraphs field cannot be translated. It's 100% true. That's why you get that big warning right there that says it's not supported. But what they don't tell you is that paragraph fields can be. So while you can't translate the actual field that holds them, you can translate all of the paragraphs. And once translation is enabled, it works just like any other operations tab um, or primary action. It just is there for you whenever you need it per entity type that you enabled it for. Configuration translation can be found either in that regional languages section. There's a whole configurations um, language section that lets you have access to any bit of configuration on the site and translate it directly there. 
or you can go into any entity type. Um, this is my content type screen, and I'm going to be translating the book's content type. Um, instead of manage fields, it's just an extra option on there. So this is translating the book's content or booklet's content type for this view, it, or this site. It doesn't give me a whole lot of information. I get to translate the word booklet and the field label title, and that's about it, which is not super helpful um, because only my editors are going to see that. So instead, you have to go in and manage your fields. Just like creating a new field, if you manage one of the fields, you'll get a translation option, and you can translate that field on that content type. So it has to be done field by field, and that works the same for paragraphs, custom block types, any fielded entity. Uh, it lets you translate the label, help text, which only your editors are going to see, but if you have multilingual editors, that's very helpful. Uh, it also lets you do any field settings that you set. So if it's a select list, you can translate your values here, um, Boolean labels, anything like that. Views is a whole other animal. Views is, for some reason, their UI is completely different when you're translating than it normally is, which kind of threw me off at first because like, I always hide the master display and am used to just the regular views interface that has been there for forever. But this is what you get when you're translating a view. So where do we go? I want to translate a filter on providers and clinics. So I have to drill into that display, drill into its display options, drill into filters, hopefully find the filter that I want because it doesn't tell you which one is which, but I know that this one is my one search API full text filter that I want to add it. So okay, yep, it's the keywords, that's good. And now I finally get to translate it. So you have to dig down a little deep and kind of wonder your way around, but you can translate the entire view, whether it's, you know, the views header, views footer, no results text, um, kind of whatever you want can be gotten to through here. You just have to stumble around and find it, basically. Interface translation. So interface translation is probably by far the easiest type of translation to set up from a development aspect. Uh, you go to region languages, interface translation, and you see this. And basically, all you do is you type in what your default language text is and the language you want to translate it to, hit filter, and it will say, okay, I found providers and clinics. What do you want it to be in Spanish? And after I do that and save it, switch it to Hmong and say, okay, still providers and clinics. Here's your Hmong. So that's super easy. It's not that easy and intuitive to set up and get to work um, with your custom twig strings, which is what all of this, those are. Uh, but we'll show you how to do that in a little bit. Okay, so that's basically it for multilingual. Um, at this point, a content editor can get in, they can edit, they can do the translations. We've set up all of the configuration and interface translations. That's really all you need to do. That was not super difficult. However, for an editor, it will be pretty difficult to actually work with. So we're going to go a little further and do some extra steps. Let's make things a little bit better because by default, if you have four content translations of this um, single booklet node, this is one an editor sees when it goes in there. Well, how do they know which one is which? How do they know if I click on one, does it go to Spanish, does it go to Hmong? It doesn't really matter, they all go to English, um, but why have four of them there? It really doesn't make much sense. So let's say, okay, we're doing that, and now Sally is in there doing this fantastic Spanish translation. She's really rocking it out saves it, yep, looks fantastic, and now she wants to go do something else, say add a menu link or something like that. So she goes to structure, and what language is she in? How do you know? Like, she was just doing Spanish, is she still in Spanish? The whole screen's English, is she in English? She's still in Spanish, but other than a couple of translated words in the admin toolbar, there's no way that she can tell. And if she wants to go back to English, there's no way to get back to English without editing the URL and taking ES out of it, which is not super apparent. So besides it being tough to know what language you're in, it's tough to know when you're editing in a language what you're editing. Like, it's been quite a while since Sally's two years of high school Spanish. She has no clue you know, what ordinary day courses is or anything like that. So unless she's very, very familiar with this booklets node, how does she know what fields to even do what in. And then there's web forms. So it's a little tough to see, but this is a, about the middle of a pretty long web form. 
And when you translate web forms, you have to do it in YAML, which is awesome for everybody. Uh, you basically have to take whatever is your English and manually type it very accurately into whatever language you're doing and making sure not to mess up any colons or apostrophes or anything like that. So that's not fantastic either, but that's the only way to do it. So let's make, them, make things a little bit easier. Instead of having all four of those nodes rendered on the views page, let's add a language filter that says, okay, read the interface language, figure out what language you're in, and only show the translation node for that language. And that interface translation filter is this one right down here. This translate language, use whatever has been selected for that page. And besides that one, you want to make a note to use that rendering language. That's going to say, okay, one, I'm going to print the view in Spanish or English or whatever, and I'm only going to show that one translated note which cleans this up dramatically. Now we're back to our normal view that we're all, you know, know and love, or don't super love. <laughs> Depending upon, you know, who you are. So besides that, let's go a step further and add a language column that says, okay, this node is in Spanish. Why not? Let's make it a little easier when you're actually moving around. And, okay, I just added my Spanish translation now I'm going to go back in and do something else. Well, I know I'm translating Spanish because it tells it right there. And it gives me a link to get back to English. That's super easy to do. Just a little bit of JS and some CSS and a custom module or in an admin sub theme, anything that lets you plug into the admin side. Uh, it's just a couple lines of code, but it will really make things easier on your editor. And the node edit form. That's generally a good thing to clean up anyways, and field groups are fantastic for this. The one thing that I figured out in multilingual is field groups can have their labels translated, but it's not done by default. So if you just basically add the word field and put it even a single field in a field group, now Sally knows that that's the resource order field, and she's not afraid of editing it anymore because I told her what it is, even though it's got basically the same information other than the word field, it's not going to be translated. So you can do English labels for your editors and still have Spanish translations for your field label on the other side. It also just makes the form easier to use. And web forms, there's nothing you can do. It is what it is, training. That's about it, either that or don't let your editors do it and do it yourself. So site builders, is anybody a site builder? Anybody? No? Dan? Yeah? Okay. I got tips in here for just about everybody. So, Tips for site builders. This is all about the little things. What are all the little things that you can do, one, not only to get all of the content translated that you might not think about, but also to make things a little easier for people. So Linkit and Pathologic are two modules you use on every single site. Um, if you don't, you probably should. I would highly recommend it. And Linkit does not work out of the box with translations. However, Linkit 8.5 with a path for, patch for PathLogic does. And what this does is it says, okay, I'm editing in Spanish, but I know I want to link to the Rights and Responsibilities booklet. So I can type in that English word because I don't, can't remember what the title is in Spanish, and it's going to come up and it's going to say, okay, do you mean this booklet? And it's the right one because it can read through that translation to find the existing translation in the same language. If there is no existing Spanish translation, it will give me the English translation. And then as soon as a Spanish translation becomes available, it will automatically link to that Spanish translation if the site's in Spanish in the future. So it's super smart. Um, and like I said, I set this up last year, so I don't even know if you still need a patch after 8.7, but you do need the 8.5 link version at least. Transliteration, this is in Search API. Um, basically that takes your weird characters and puts them into something that translation or that Search API tokens and things can work with. So I use this on every single site, multilingual or not, for things like apostrophes in people's names or titles. Uh, without that, Search API doesn't work as great. It's also perfect for accents, umlauts, all of the special characters that different languages have. So that's definitely a must, and it's basically just a checkbox. Our views duplicates are back. So we have to do the same thing as before, 
go in, add that interface language filter, say render in the language that I'm in, and this will get back to how it should look with just one of these. But you have to do that for every single view that is translated, anyways, or has translated content. And last but not least, the alt and the title field. You should be requiring alt tags for accessibility on any media entity or image field that you have on your site. And if you're requiring them and having people do them in English, why not do them in every language? So you have to go into your image field and manually translate the alt and the title. All right, for designers in the room, yeah. Different languages look different. Plain and simple. Uh, this is Hmong and English. The same links, but Hmong uses, what's that, like eight or nine words for basically two English words. That happens very common. A lot of languages may be a lot longer, a lot shorter, use a lot more words. It's pretty obvious, but it's not something a lot of people think of. So maybe designers leave a little bit more white space, be a little bit more flexible on font sizes and how things are positioned in relation to other things because it will save your themers a lot of time and headaches. And then there's the whole right to left language thing and the decisions that come with that, both between you and the client. Somali is a right to left language, so when I first did this multilingual project for this site, I set it up as right to left. I themed it mirrored right to left because I thought that was the right thing to do. As soon as the client saw it, they're like, no. It's a right to left language, but the whole site doesn't go right to left. So I wasted you know, some hours doing that. Uh, so that's a, a conversation with both your designer and your client. And if it does go right to left, what elements only go right to left? Are we actually doing it? How does that impact the design? Like these are things that you really should plan for before you even get into the process. But it might not be something that everybody thinks of. I certainly did not. All right, tips for front enders. This is more my deal. So we've got views. This is translating view, and anybody who has done custom twig strings, I do it pretty much every site. Uh, you have to wrap it in some sort of translation tag or use the pipe T filter. And it took me a while to figure out what the difference is. Basically, the pipe T filter only works on individual strings, simple strings of text. Translation tag will work with placeholders, some simple variables, and simple, th simple strings. So basically, I use that regardless. I never use pipe T because I don't see much point in it. But one or the other will get this into interface translation. That being said, I have to translate this field, or these strings. Then I have to clear cache to get a, the template to register. Then I have to actually visit where this template lives on the site in a different language in order to get it to show up in the interface languages, which took me, I won't say how long to figure out. So I kept, kept like, all right, I translated that. Why is it not letting me actually do the interface translations? You need to actually visit it for Drupal to, to pick it up. Here's one that I think that you should use regardless of multilingual, but it's magic for multilingual. Um, this is path entity node canonical. This is basically the same as link to content in the views UI. So instead of you know having a custom link in a template that says slash node slash 845 or you know hyphen providers and clear slash providers, you know hyphen clinics, whatever, whatever your link is, instead of doing that hard coded path, this will go out, it'll find that node, it will render the link in the um, path alias for it. And in multilingual, it will automatically detect the language prefix to use. So all of your links will go to the correct translation for whatever node you're on. JS. JS cannot be translated in Drupal, at least not by any method that I know of or could find. So you have to do it all in JS code, which is fantastic. It's actually not horrible, but it means that you're writing a lot of variables to say, okay, is this English? Is this Spanish? Is this Somali? If so, then my language code is, you know, slash whatever. My link is this. You have to define all of that ahead of time for every place you're using jQuery. In this case, I'm basically doing a custom results um, list on search API. And then you use all of that down below, actually pretty easy once you have all those variables set up. It just all has to be done in code. 
All right, so Drupal ships with a language selector box, block, which is that four languages up there. That's gonna let a user pick whatever language they want for whatever node they're on, and then it stays in that language as long as they've selected it. However, it's not super smart. It just prints out all of the languages you have enabled, whether or not that node actually has a translation for them, which is not great because this is the Hmong um, translation for this node, which is what a user clicked on, except for there's no actual Hmong translation for this node, so the only thing translated is the, basically the header, which is not fantastic. So we're gonna get a little smart, use some pre-process, and pre-process the links um, for that language block, and go out, find the node, get the translations for that node, which is a fantastic method that I use quite a bit, and pass that as a trans info variable to the language link switcher links template. So this is saying, okay, for all of these languages, if there's a key for it in trans info, so if there's a translation for it, then go ahead and print each one of those languages. Otherwise, just do what you're gonna do and print them all. And the reason we need that otherwise is because what happens if you get to a views page or something that's not a node? I don't want to find every single entity type on the site and do all of those checks and 95%, 98% of my content is nodes. So I'm just going to check there and then I'll go back to the you know dumb way of doing it after that. So that tells me this. Okay, I might be a Hmong visitor going to this site or a Spanish visitor or whatever, but if there's no option in my native language or whatever language I want to see, then I don't want to be set up for failure by clicking on it. So this is only printing the languages for the actual translations. And fun stuff. So on this one, booklets um, basically needed chapter, section, nav, and we wanted to be able to page through all of these parts of a booklet for legal services. However, we didn't want to use the books module because I don't like to reload the page if I don't really have to. A lot of times it saves a lot of work or Ajax is buggy. I didn't really want to use either. All of the content is text, so loading it all at once and then just doing some jQuery magic or whatever to show hide and basically build a custom book wouldn't be a big performance hit. So that's how we figured out we're gonna do it. However, in order to do that, these are all paragraphs. I need to have my nav live somewhere on the site. So I built a placeholder field for it, just a blank field and this is the twig that I put in that. So I'm saying, okay, for all of my paragraph chapters, go out and find the chapter title field, which I required so that I didn't have to do that conditional, and put that in a top level nav, and then for any section paragraph in that chapter paragraph, go out and find that title, add that to the nav. However, these can be translated, and you can't really do complex translation variables in twig, which took me forever to figure out. So I can't just say, go through and find the Spanish chapter title in straight twig. Well, I can, but you have to go through the methods. So we're saying, okay, for each one of these, first find out what's the current language. Is it Spanish? Okay, great. Is it Hmong? Is it whatever? Go through and do that, and then if so, go out, find the chapter, find the entity, get the translation in that language that you get translation method that we used in the pre-process, print the title field for it, otherwise print the English title field in case that one chapter doesn't have a translation. So it's a lot of code just to print things in a different language, but that get translation was pretty much the only way to do it, and the only way I could find that was through Kint. So that ends up basically working like this. Go to safety, go to the next one, Reloads on the page, scrolls you back up. I want to view it in Spanish. And it all still works. Without all of the checks and if uh, else is in that though, this will throw fatal errors. So this does work. It's not bulletproof and I'm sure there's a better way to do it and probably a back end way, but this will work. So project managers, they have a part in this too. Remember when I said, how does this impact timeline and budget? It's this, this is exactly how. This magic formula basically says, for all of the entity types you translate, 
times that by the number of languages, divided by how many developers you have, times that by the number of coffee they consume per developer, and then break that down into the square root of the design complexity times by the number of right to left languages. Roughly comes out to one third. This is patented, no photos please. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, since it's you, since it's you, that's fine. No, this, this is just basically hard and fast, but this is kind of what we found out for a larger site with three or four languages. You're roughly bumping things up by a third. It's a good place to start anyways when you're planning. The other thing that you have to do is so content editors can just get in there. They can load their own translations. They can do all that. How do we do all of those configuration and interface translations? Where do we track them? How do we figure out? Because they're all coming, in this case, from the client. They're providing all of them. So we created this spreadsheet that says, OK, these are all the different types of translations, where they are, the text that's going to be translated, and then blank spaces for each language. And we turned this over to the client and said, here you go. Fill in your translations, pass it back to us, we'll get it done which basically looks like this. So when I get this back, I can not have to try and find out where these go. I can say, oh, that's right. My field node legal resource type has watched the video. I can just go in and do that in the interface translation, but in order to get that to show up in the interface translation, remember I have to visit that template, which is why I needed to know where it was. The one hugest thing that a project manager can remember in this, or developer or anything, lock down your English or default language, whatever it is, content before you translate anything. The reason for that is if I re, uh, say watch the video goes to watch the videos or something else, that means I have to go and get the translators to re-update their end of it. Then I have to go in and change that in English. Then I have to go in and change it in Spanish, then Hmong, then Somali. Like it compounds the work by the number of languages. So the more you can 100% lock your client into, which they will change later, but you know, the more you can try to lock them into, the more headaches and time you're gonna save. So key takeaways. Multilingual significantly increases the complexity, timeline, and budget of your project. There is no way around that. It is a large, large task but it's the best way to communicate to users in their native language, which since we're all trying to be a global community, that's a good thing to do. So if you have the project budget for it and the development resources or know how to get those resources, I would definitely recommend it. Lock in your default language text and translations, is what we just went over. Any change compounds it by the X factor of whatever. That goes for the entity types that you're translation, translating to and things like that. The more you have, built out and planned out and locked in ahead of time, the better off you're going to be. If I had to go in and add something to that chapter section relationship, like say there's a subsection, now I have to go in and I have to edit all of those hundreds of lines of twig to try and include that one other thing. So pre-planning is huge. And then go slow and remember the small things. Remember your alt text, your translation tags, remember leaving a little bit more white space no matter what role you have in the project, think through all of the possible implications before you go in there and start actually doing them, and it will save you time. That is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Want me to go back and cover anything else? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the design process that you took as a team to think through like what impacts your... I can. I easily can. Language? Yes, I easily can. Um, basically none. Because remember, I, we did not do this the right way. I built a mirrored right to left language when I didn't have to. And I didn't realize what Hmong and everything would do to things like those small areas. So basically, our process, because this was the first one that we did, was building it and then going through and QAing it and making the changes afterwards which was not fantastic. What I would have recommended and what we will do in the future when working with larger multilingual sites is we will build a prototype and go in and actually do some translations and figure out what that text equates to if we know some bits of text so that we can know 
what that language is going to do. And then the designer can say, okay, I know these menu items either need to have a smaller font or they need to be spaced out differently. Or if I'm doing a grid of icons and titles, I know that this one might end up being four or five lines long for a single word. Um, so going in there and playing around before you design and actually doing some translations, because you can spin up just a vanilla site, add multilingual, and do some configuration or interface or content translations in a matter of hours. You know, it's not, not difficult to set up. There's just a lot of gotchas. So I would just go in there and, and play around first and then design. Did you have somebody on the client side with that language knowledge that could be your resource to make sure that in the end you were, like, good? Yeah. Um, I, I don't 100% know the answer to that because they were getting their translations from actual native speakers and I think they had a team for a couple of different languages but each each language had their own little translation unit if you will filling in the translations and then we were just going through and queuing that afterwards um, and some of those translations definitely changed and I wasn't a, a part of that part of the conversation so I, I believe what happened is we spun up the alpha site with the translations said okay go in test everything out, see how everything looks. And then they did come back with a round of updated translations in that translation sheet. So I think they turned the site over to their translators and said, is this working for you? Which if you can do is probably what I would highly recommend actually giving it to, I mean, you want to do user testing anyways, but if you can give it to native language speakers and have them user test, like that's going to be the best thing. Two more questions. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm just wondering if the slide decks are available this year. Um, I can definitely put them on a repo somewhere. There's a there's a upload field on in your session note. Okay. Just upload your files there. Sweet, we'll do so. So if the speakers upload, choose to upload them, they have to be deep way to do it. I will upload them after this. Awesome. And then. And I'm sorry. All the sessions are recorded, and those will be available. This has been great. The last thing that comes with multi-language sometimes is um, uh, if you're doing the multi-language for people in other countries, is addresses and phone numbers, did you tackle that at all, the different formats? We did not um, because there's, at the start, there wasn't address and phone numbers to be translated they did add a phase two translation component with contact information, um, but that was not configuration translation, that was content. So they had their actual service providers in there translating their content, and I'm not sure how they dealt with that. Um, if we had a different situation where I was building an address out of view fields or something like that, like the address field, and yeah, you have to do the different configurations. Um, one of the big things was we wrote some JavaScript that turned telephone numbers into links. If we had international phone numbers, then we would have to build a variable array that says, okay, if this language is in this, then add this prefix code, or if it reads this. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have to deal with that on this site, but that could definitely add a level of complexity that you'd have to plan for, depending upon whether or not it was content. And if it is content, even just training your content editors to recognize that what those different formats are. So Drupal dates does have an address module that is pretty international aware. Right, so I, that's the Commerce Guys code that I was using for the for the language code. So I, I would okay. hope that they would be pretty up on it. Um, dates are also a, a big thing, translating the the different dates into different formats because this site was is so localized to Minnesota, and they're just serving that client base in Minnesota. I, I don't know that that was ever even really thought of or brought up, um, but maybe it should have been, you know. Yeah, and those are like, there's so much to plan for, there's no way you can hit it all. Um, but anything you can think of should at least, the question should at least be raised, you know. Is this something that we're worried about? I, I was just curious, um, uh, it sounds like you probably didn't, but like, 
there are a couple companies that provide kind of like translation services that mm -hmm. integrate so well with Drupal. You don't have any experience with those? Or? We do not. We, although Lingotech keeps asking me to sit down and hire them um, I'm sure they for, for anything. But no, the, the client was going to provide the translations on this, so we didn't have to, but I could definitely see a larger product, uh, a larger you know, client with more complex language needs or something having, having to go that way simply because otherwise it would be kind of unmanageable. Yeah, I think it's more for the customers who are kind of, you know, we don't have an expert in that language, and we, but we yeah. still want to have a website in that language or something. So. Yeah, and I, I don't know how smooth or rough that goes or really what the process is i would assume that it'd be pretty smooth and good um if you can afford it and have the need for it because the companies there's companies for it and they seem to be doing good so i, would, I think uh, that's the case too i just most of what i've heard from customers or sites that i've been dealing with that had that or use that maybe was also drupal 7 sites and drupal 7 translation is a little bit more complicated too so yeah i, I was glad that we did not have a need for this until drupal 8 mainly for that reason, Drupal 7 so those companies a little scary. With the translation module, or are they just front end? They do, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, and I, I went to a multilingual session um, in DrupalCon, and yeah, it was it was LingoTech led, and they did have a service that basically did a lot of this just out of the box um, on their end of things. They plugged into it. They did the configuration, the interface translations, um, which definitely would have been nice. It would have been a little easier, but. I'm sure it. Uh, I'm sure it's not cheap too. Yeah. I presume there's also backend considerations. So I, I did have a slide in here with tips for backenders, and then realized that I had none, um, so I took it out. But yeah, basically, it would be because PHP and Twig kind of work hand in hand in the interface translation part of it. So if you're doing custom strings. Um, in your PHP module for something, you would have to use. Um, I'm not sure what the what the filter is or what makes it translatable. I'm assuming it's wrapping it in a T function would make it translatable. Um, the thing that I don't know about is if you need to do anything for, say, you're building like a config form or something like that. I don't know if you need to do anything to translate the labels or enable them to be translated. I remember seeing something in the autocomplete module that. Uh, okay. It was just an extra call on, on the text that was returned. Yeah, and if it's if it's text, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a PHP filter function that will that will enable that. But I don't know offhand what it is, mainly because I don't do backend. <laughs> Anything else? We're just about out of time, but we got a few more minutes. So I, I just I pulled up your website because I was or this website because I was just curious about this, like. There, so there's you know a, a section of resources for one language, and then if you go to like that equivalent page in a different language, there might be different resources because they haven't been translated. How, how do you communicate that to people when they first visit the website? Like, hey, you know, you're, you're reviewing this in another language. Mm -hmm. It appears as though everything has been translated just for your language as well. So they might not be aware that that if they had switched to English, there'd be there'd be more resources that they could probably have access to. That's. A very solid question, and we don't um, right off the bat. Other than that, you know, going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's honestly something that I don't know anybody thought of for this, um, and definitely is something that I will bring up with the client because that's a, that's a very solid point. Like if you go to the legal resources page in Spanish, like they've. They've got quite a few translations in there now, but I know that they don't have everything in every language. So on some nodes, they do have, if there's like a French PDF, they have a field, read this in, you know, whatever additional languages they have. But there's no way to say, these are not all of the resources for this section of content, switch to English or something like that. Um, that's that's a very solid point. And not that there is like, Beautiful way of doing that. Either. Like I can't, I can't think of anything. I'm just wondering, like, if there's the only, the only thing that I could think of is similar to the way that we pre-process that language links to check for if there is a translation. You could check for there is no translation and somehow pass that as a variable and say, okay, if there is no translation or if there is not a translation in every language, 
then pop up this little window down in the corner that says, hey, there's more content if you switch to English. Or something, but that's that's a valid point. It, but it also, yeah, like just like the, the usability of it, like is fantastic that like I go to the language I know and all the resources that are there that I can understand mm -hmm. are all present and there's nothing else there that would be like jarring of like, oh, wait, there's a, a Spanish document and intermingled with us because there's, that's the only version of it that exists. Exactly, and that's, we had that up where we weren't, we weren't filtering everything by only if exists first in views. Um, so we did have some duplicated content and mixed content and found that to be, at least from the client's perspective, confusing. Yeah. So then we did things like, okay, if you're going to the resource library and you're in Spanish, you're only going to see the sections within that library that have an existing Spanish translation for some of their content on the end. Otherwise, don't show that section at all, um, which ends up hiding a lot of content from somebody who might be a, a very easily dual language speaker. So that's that's a really, actually a really good point. Thank you. I think the website is absolutely beautiful. Though. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, that's that guy's fault right there in the back. He's our design director. So. <laughs> There, there's one thing that I noticed it tra doesn't translate, and it's the word home at the prefix of your breadcrumb trail. I never looked at that. that. Couldn't be translated. No, I'm sure it can. Um, I just, I'm just like locked down. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming that I just missed it, and if I went into interface translation, because it's a breadcrumb. Yeah. So I'm assuming that I could translate um, the home and interface translation. Wild. Yeah, and that that's that's the thing about multilingual too. Like my disclaimer at the start of this was, this is the way I figured out how to do this for this project. But there's so much that goes into all of the little pieces and things like breadcrumbs and what happens if there's no languages that you just might not think of. So the honestly, the larger your team and the more people you have just plugging away at trying to beat it to death and break it, the better off you're going to be in this situation. It's way more important for QA and multilingual than even just a regular regular site. Doesn't this make it super high maintenance? Honestly, no. So we haven't really had anything, and we did this, I think this was 8.6.3 when we started this, um, or one of the one of the lower 8.6. No, actually it was 8.5 because we had to upgrade to media on this. So it was even pre-8.6 and this is now in 8.7 and we haven't noticed any issues and that's because they're all core modules. Um, so as long as you're doing core modules and then the custom twig, like that's pretty set in stone the way that they do it. So then nothing really breaks going forward because it just all recognizes itself. Um, so that's actually been really low maintenance. The only, the only maintenance costs are when they decide to switch the default text and you have to go update it, you know, four times. Um, that's pretty much it. I think we're out of time. So thank you. Thanks for all the questions.